Galaxy Quest celebrates the very essence of fandom. It wasn't just a parody. It wasn't just making fun of Star Trek. Back when Galaxy Quest came out, nerd culture wasn't where it is today. We weren't loud and proud. We were a little bit ashamed. Then Galaxy Quest came out. It was the first movie I've ever seen that didn't make fun of us. It had fun with us. A pure love letter to everything about Trek and conventions and nerds in general. And I think as a Star Trek fan, this is also one of the best Star Trek movies ever made. Wonderful, wonderful movie. I love it so much. It recognizes that these stories can transcend the screen. The movie speaks directly to the hearts of fans, understanding our deep connection to the world it creates and reinforcing the idea that it's okay to be unapologetically enthusiastic about the things that inspire us. It says it over and over and over again. Never give up. Never surrender. It is a love letter to Star Trek fans. It was a movie that tripped out of the starting gate, earning only $7 million in its opening weekend during Christmas 1999, Galaxy Quest, which had been severely edited to achieve a PG family-friendly rating, had earned less than half of what the highly marketed Stuart Little Mouse movie had done only a week earlier. And with the world only days away from learning whether the Y2K millennium bug would end civilization as we knew it, the people who made Galaxy Quest were wondering if their affectionate Star Trek parody hadn't already been unplugged. Then something interesting happened. On the same day people were laughing over why they had been worried about a computer-induced apocalypse, they started to go to the movies and word had gotten around that the Galaxy Quest movie was actually pretty good. It would go on to make more money in its second weekend than it had when it opened. And for four weeks in a row, Galaxy Quest held its numbers at the box office, something that rarely happens in the movie industry. A marketing snafu and studio decisions would end up being the culprit of Galaxy Quest's near failure at the box office, but we'll explore that later. In the end, the quirky sci-fi movie would end up doubling its modest $45 million budget. <laughs> Okie dokie. And after coming out the same year as blockbusters like Star Wars The Phantom Menace, The Matrix, I know Kung Fu, The Sixth Sense, and Saving Private Ryan, it would have surprised no one if this little movie about a fictional cult television series had just faded into the Hollywood history books as a footnote in the annals of sci-fi entertainment. But that isn't what happened at all. This is the story of an unlikely movie that became a cult classic. A movie that became a love letter to Star Trek fans. This is the definitive history of Galaxy Quest, and you've never heard it told like this before. So you don't want to miss this story. Explain as you would a child. Before we share things you've likely never heard about Galaxy Quest, support the channel and check out this incredible Galaxy Quest inspired graphic design. Get 20% off your purchase by using coupon code THEPOPCAST. The link is in the description below. Never give up! Never surrender! Damn the residents get it! Full speed ahead! Huh? The simple truth is that Galaxy Quest wouldn't exist without Leonard Nimoy, who played the legendary Star Trek character Spock across multiple TV shows and movies. A few decades ago, David Howard was sitting in an IMAX theater waiting for his show to begin when a trailer for a coming soon feature called Americans in Space started playing. It took Howard a moment to recognize the voice in the trailer, and then he realized it was Nimoy. Are we ready to cross the great black void to explore the other worlds in our solar system? It struck him to feel sorry for the longtime Star Trek actor, trapped in the world of space and science fiction, successful but typecast all the same and unable to escape. Howard thought there was something funny in a situation where it would be hard for the actor to walk away. And that is how we got the cult classic movie Captain Starshine. I mean, Galaxy Quest. Howard penned a spec script called Captain Starshine. It followed the story of an actor who played the captain of a starship on a long finished science fiction TV show, and aliens come to Earth mistaking him for the real deal. 
hijinks ensue. Please, Commander, you are our last hope. But Howard wasn't a Hollywood power player. He was a writing hopeful trying to break into the industry. As luck would have it, Howard was at the right place at the right time with the right idea. Men in Black had recently come out and was a huge success, so studios were looking for the next big screen science fiction comedy. Howard had submitted his spec script to this guy, producer Mark Johnson. Yes, the same Mark Johnson who won an Academy Award for Rain Man in 1989. Johnson was working as an independent producer for the new studio DreamWorks, famously created by Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and David Geffen. Johnson got a call from Walter Parks, who was the head of development at DreamWorks, and told Johnson they were desperate for movies. Another feature had fallen apart, and DreamWorks had a slot for a family comedy. Johnson told Parks about Howard's first draft of Captain Starshine, and Parks said they had to have it. Now. It's all real. Oh my god. I knew it! I knew it! <laughs> the movie that would be Galaxy Quest was off to the races. Johnson and his team, that included executive producer Elizabeth Kintillan, met with a lot of writers. All of the writers came in with the idea that the main character hated being the captain and was trapped in the role. But when Robert Gordon came into Cantillan's office, he said he loved being the captain. If he could be the captain again, it would be the greatest day of his life. That was the thought that changed everything for the movie. Gordon was asked to write the screenplay, but the producers didn't want him to read the original script because they didn't want him to be influenced by it. Gordon's only credited writing work for the big screen up until this point was the 1997 rom-com Addicted to Love, starring Matthew Broderick and Meg Ryan. Oh, God. I'll have what she's having. Although Gordon was a huge fan of Star Trek the original series and had watched every episode over and over since 1966, he wasn't sure he could write the script. It wasn't until he got to the scene where the crew had to admit to the aliens that they were not really heroes, just actors, and everything starts to fall apart. We, uh, we pretended. We lied. Oh. Yes. It was at that moment he felt like he had the confidence to write something great. In fact, he was so confident, he told the producers that they needed to go into space. Prior to Gordon coming on board, they had thought the movie would just have the aliens come to Earth and interact with the characters. Gordon was making the movie bigger than the producers thought they could afford. Later, Mark Johnson would admit that the studio never really understood the tone of the movie. They greenlit the film on Gordon's first draft, but they also believed they were getting a slapstick comedy like Spaceballs. I can't breathe in this thing! Which explains why they hired legendary comedy director Harold Ramis to make the movie. Yes, the guy who made Caddyshack, National Lampoon's Vacation, and Groundhog's Day was going to be making Galaxy Quest. Do you have any hobbies? I collect spores, molds, and fungus. The dry-humored director and star of movies like Stripes and Ghostbusters already had the actor in mind he wanted to play the lead role of Jason Nesmith. It was Tim Allen, right? Well, you know the old expression, nope. Ramis wanted talented physical comedy veteran Kevin Kline, but Kline passed on the role citing personal reasons, with some believing he didn't want to leave New York. Ironically, Klein would go on to star in another movie that released six months prior to Galaxy Quest, the $170 million Will Smith sci-fi western would go down as one of the most expensive films ever made, as well as a commercial failure. Good night, ma'am. I told you she'd be a distraction. But Klein wasn't the only person Ramis would have been happy to work with. Bruce Willis, Tim Robbins, Mel Gibson, Steve Martin, Bill Murray, and Robin Williams. The problem was, none of these guys wanted the role. Then Ramis wanted Alec Baldwin, and Baldwin really wanted the role bad. And we could be playing golf with him right now instead of Ted, who's best known for getting caught using a corporate credit card at a gay strip club. The only problem was, Jeffrey Katzenberg, one of the founders of DreamWorks, had someone else in mind. Tim Allen was a household name in 1998 when they were casting Galaxy Quest. Best known for his number one hit TV show Home Improvement, Allen had made the leap to movies playing iconic characters like Santa Claus and the voice of Buzz Lightyear in Toy Story. I am Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace. One of the things that made Allen an interesting choice for Galaxy Quest is that he is a self-proclaimed huge sci-fi junkie with a collection of old movie props and collectibles that only a true sci-fi nerd could have. To prove the point, late in the production when Galaxy Quest was about to wrap, 
Alan would bug Sigourney Weaver to sign a piece of the wall of the ship Nostromo from the movie Alien. She would eventually sign it, Stolen by Tim Allen, Love Sigourney Weaver which made Alan mad because he was going to put it in his screening room. So Alan takes his sci-fi stuff seriously. He really wanted to do Galaxy Quest and was hoping the second half of his career would be in science fiction. But while Alan may have been at the top of Katzenberg's list, Ramus didn't see it. The three sat down for lunch with Alan thinking he already had the part. Ramus and Katzenberger looked at each other and Ramus told him they were circling the idea and wasn't sure if he was right for the role. Ramus explained that rather than getting a comedian to play an action hero, they were looking for an action hero to be funny. Alan has since reflected that he didn't think that's what Ramus was saying because he'd already offered the role to several comedians. The real story behind Ramus dragging his feet on Alan was that he'd made the movie Club Paradise with Robin Williams in 1986. The movie failed in a huge way and Ramus felt like it was his fault. He didn't feel like he heard William's comic voice the way he should have and was concerned the same thing would happen with Alan. And when you consider the lead actors in most of Ramus' comedies that have been successful, they are typically mild-mannered, low-key, dry-humored individuals. Alan, like Williams, has a more alpha, in-your-face sort of humor. Obviously, both types of humor has its place, but Ramus was self-aware enough to know he might not be able to make a comedy that fit Alan's personality. And since the studio was firm on Alan being the guy, Ramus stepped down. Ramus would eventually see the movie and repeat over and over again how wrong he'd been. Ramus was ultimately impressed with Alan's performance. If Ramus had never stepped down, Galaxy Quest would have likely been a totally different movie and likely not the movie we love so much today. Alan would end up turning down Disney's The Kid to do Galaxy Quest. Ironically, Bruce Willis, who passed on Galaxy Quest, would end up doing that movie instead. I love actors who still are children and they can't hide it. And Tim is a big child. Mark Johnson knew that once Harold Ramis left, it was going to put a big question mark into the minds of the studio that could put the movie in danger. So Johnson made sure that the vacuum left by Ramis' departure was filled with things like building sets and casting to keep the momentum going in a way that would make the studio feel comfortable and at the same time be ready to start production. The team quickly met with eight to 10 directors, but when Dean Pariseau read the script, he asked Johnson how come he never offered him things like this. Johnson vouched for Pariseau with the studio and because everything was such a mess, they agreed to let him direct. Timing was on Dean's side for this because not only was he not considered a director of this caliber for this film, the only movie he'd done up to this point was entering the box office at about the same time he was getting the job for Galaxy Quest. That movie, Home Fries, starring Drew Barrymore and Luke Wilson, written by future Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan, would barely break $10 million at the box office. Is that like the one your mom works at? Uh, is she still offering the two-for-one discount? <laughs> A really big reason why Galaxy Quest is the cultural phenomenon it is today is thanks to Pariso. But had Home Fries come out six months earlier, it begs the question of whether the studio would have trusted him to do Galaxy Quest. The good news was that, like Gordon, who wrote the script, Pariseau was a huge Star Trek fan growing up. His brother took his mother's gray station wagon and wrote the Enterprise hull number NCC-1701 on the door. Then the boys put two tubes on the roof rack and shot rockets off the top. Ironically, Pariseau's first television directing job was the episode of Reading Rainbow in which host LeVar Burton takes viewers behind the scenes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Pariseau knew there were a lot of themes playing in the movie, and he felt it needed to begin as a mockery to the fan experience, but end as a celebration. More than anything else, he wanted to make a great episode of Star Trek. Before Galaxy Quest, there was a stigma against fans who dressed up in cosplay and went to conventions. William Shatner's famous Saturday Night Live skit, where he tells a room full of convention Trekkies to get a life and move out of their parents' basement, was high humor. It's just a TV show. <laughs> I mean, look at you, look at the way you're dressed. But the truth of the matter is those fans are the reason Star Trek and for that matter, Galaxy Quest exists today. When Star Trek went into syndication, the first fan convention took place on January 21st, 1972. More than 3,000 people attended the New York event. It would be the excitement of the Star Trek fans that convinced Paramount Pictures to begin developing Star Trek The Motion Picture in 1975. 
The fans brought Star Trek back to life, and because art imitates life, it would be the Galaxy Quest fans who would make their show real, and Pariso masterfully captured this feeling while making the movie. Galaxy Quest was one of the first films to celebrate the relationship fans have with these types of stories. Dean Pariseau walked into a movie that was meant to be goofy and slapstick, turned it upside down, and gave it a heart. And while the director is responsible for the tone and direction of the movie, it would take an amazing ensemble cast to bring this Star Trek love letter to life. Tim Allen had already been cast in the lead as Jason Nesmith, an actor who played Peter Quincy Taggart, commander of the NSEA Protector, on a TV show called Galaxy Quest. Nesmith was modeled after William Shatner's appearance in Star Trek The Motion Picture, right down to the haircut and squared off sideburns. Although Alan would later say that when he was sitting in the captain's chair, he liked the way Yul Brenner sat on the throne as King Ramses in the 1956 movie The Ten Commandments. But as we all know, a captain is only as good as his crew. Alan Rickman was cast as Alexander Dane who played the ship's science officer, Dr. Lazarus, an alien species known for their super intelligence and psionic powers. The Spock Nimoy-like character was actually the bad guy in the original Captain Starshine, but in Galaxy Quest, Alexander Dane was not only tired of being typecast in the same role, but also tired of being overshadowed by Alan's character. Dane accuses Nesmith of stealing his best lines and cutting him from entire episodes, which referenced the alleged behavior of William Shatner during the production of Star Trek the original series. Rickman had a lot in common with Dane, and there is a real sense that Rickman embodies the character. Rickman, like Dane, had been typecast as a bad guy in blockbuster pictures like Die Hard and Robin Hood. No more merciful beheadings. And call off Christmas. Not a fan of science fiction, part of choosing Galaxy Quest, aside from him finding the material very funny, was doing something outside his typical role. Like Dane, Rickman also came from a Shakespearean acting background, so the actor had a lot of real-life experience to pull from for the role. Rickman had once been considered for a role in another space adventure. He nearly played the character of Moff Jergerod, commander of the second Death Star during Star Wars Return of the Jedi, but was beat out by Michael Pennington. According to Pariseau, Rickman, who is a serious actor, is incredibly funny in the role because he committed completely to it. By Grabthar's hammer, um, you shall be avenged. Everyone was surprised to learn the Galaxy Quest blonde bombshell with an ample bosom in a jumpsuit was Sigourney Weaver, science fiction legend Sigourney Weaver. Her take on Gwen DeMarco, who played Lieutenant Tawny Madison, the ship's communication officer, couldn't be more different from Alien's Ellen Ripley. Weaver got wind of the movie while Ramis was still directing. She felt like Galaxy Quest was that great Wizard of Oz story, with these people feeling so incomplete in the beginning, and during the course of their adventure, they come out almost like the heroes they pretend to be in the first place. She felt like Madison was what a lot of women, including herself, feel like in a Hollywood situation. Weaver was perfect for the role, but the only problem was they didn't want anyone who had ever done science fiction to be in the movie. This surprised her, saying, who better than the people who lived in science fiction to understand what they're doing? When Pariseau took over as director, Weaver was relentless about the role, and she was finally cast. Now it's hard to imagine anyone else who could have pulled off Gwen. Weaver said that whenever she put on the blonde wig to become Gwen DeMarco, she could feel her IQ drop precipitously. She loved being a starlet so much, she frequently wore the wig and fake bosom home after a long day of shooting. Look. I have one job on this lousy ship. It's stupid, but I'm gonna do it, okay? Sam Rockwell was a nobody in comparison to his co-stars, which was perfect for a guy playing a character named Guy. Guy, you probably don't remember me, do you? It's the sunglasses, right? Got killed by a lava monster before the first commercial. Ah! Guy Fliegman's claim to fame was playing crewman number six, a nobody part of the original Galaxy Quest series. Rockwell, who got his start as a child actor way back in 1979 as one of Joan Crawford's children, had been bouncing around Hollywood for a decade doing random episodes on TV shows and bit parts in forgettable movies. But December of 1999 would be his coming out party. Only 19 days before Galaxy Quest would hit theaters, The Green Mile also hit theaters and would garner four Oscars with Rockwell playing the memorable role of Wild Bill Wharton. 
Today, Rockwell is an A-list actor and considered one of the best at his craft. But in late 1998, he admits he may have been taking himself too seriously. He was going to pass on the part of Guy and opt for a small movie opposite Marissa Tomei until his friend Kevin Spacey convinced him to take the part. Rockwell justified the position, saying, with the Green Mile and Galaxy Quest coming out so close to each other, he wouldn't get typecast. What a perfect movie for him to be in with that frame of mind. Of course, Rockwell would go on to steal so many scenes like the red thingy moving toward the green thingy and Oh, that's not right! Rockwell based his portrayal on Bill Paxton's classic performance in Aliens, in particular his fear of being killed and his mental collapse upon seeing a motion detector and the enemy closing in on them. Did you guys ever watch the show? Tony Shalhoub went into the audition for the part of Guy Fleegman, but when Rockwell got the part, they offered him the role of Fred Kwan, who played Tech Sergeant Chen, the ship's engineer. At the time, Shalhoub was best known for his role as Antonio Scarpacci on the TV show Wings. Later, he'd become universally recognized from the TV show Monk. Shalhoub and Pariseau worked together to develop the Quan character loosely basing him on David Carradine, who was also a non-Asian in an Asian role in the Kung Fu television series. There had been an urban legend that Carradine frequently acted in Kung Fu while under the influence of drugs. But while Shalhoub could not directly portray a stoner in a PG-13 film, he subtly used that direction. He even insisted that Quan should always be eating something to reference the stoner stereotype. It's the simple things in life you treasure. Daryl Chill Mitchell had worked with Pariseau in Home Fries, this ain't pickle burger. which gave him the inside track to play Tommy Weber over David Alan Greer. Weber was the adult actor who played Lieutenant Laredo, a precocious child pilot from the original Galaxy Quest series. While not initially planned for Tommy Weber's character to have been a child, the production had to account for Mitchell's age. The trope worked perfectly, considering Star Trek The Next Generation had its own child crew member in Wesley Crusher. Up until that point, Mitchell was better best known for his time on the John Larroquette show, as well as Veronica's Closet. Ah! Ah! Oh! For Justin Long, Galaxy Quest was his first cinematic appearance. Despite being up against Kieran Culkin, Eddie K. Thomas, and Tom Everett Scott, he won the role of Galaxy Quest superfan Brandon Weger. He got the role channeling Michael J. Fox from Back to the Future, Philip Seymour Hoffman from Boogie Nights, and the comic book guy from The Simpsons. Apparently, he also has a superhuman tolerance for irony, which unfortunately, I do not. Long, who was almost the host of Blue's Clues, used that opportunity to get him a shot at Galaxy Quest. But the opportunity was almost short-lived. According to Long, Steven Spielberg is the reason he was in the movie. They were going to cut his role down to almost nothing, but Spielberg said that it needed an element to connect to the fans, a human element. Boy, was Spielberg right, because it can be argued that Brandon Weger represents all of us fans in that movie. We're gonna help Laredo guide it on the Vox Ultra Frequency Carrier and use Roman Camels for visual confirmation. All right, all right, dinner's at seven. The aliens in Galaxy Quest represent the fans. They are the ultimate keepers of the joy and happiness that fans carry in their hearts about a show they love. In this case, they just didn't know it wasn't real. There is a story that some Americans in the 1960s, believing that the sitcom Gilligan's Island was a true story, attempted to organize a rescue for the castaways. So the Thermians were not alone. And because Pariseau was so open to ideas, it's no surprise that during the production of Galaxy Quest, it wasn't quite as planned out as one might expect. And Enrico Colantoni, who played Mathazar, leader of the Thermians, was a great example of how that flexibility worked. When Enrico came into audition, it was good, but not exactly what Pariseau was looking for. Enrico must have sensed that his performance wasn't great because as he was getting up to go, he told the director there was a voice that he wanted to do. Pariseau asked him to do it, and that was the moment the Thermians we know from the movie were born. Enrico had been taught a vocal exercise at the Yale School of Drama that hit all seven vocal resonators and produced a sound that will forever now be thought of as Thermian. As soon as Pariseau heard it, he thought it was genius. So as he started casting other people, he tried duplicating the voice. And when Missy Pyle came into audition for a Thermian role, she was shown Enrico's audition, which is not something that is typically done. 
The funny thing about it is, Enrico didn't even know he had the job when they were using his audition to show other actors how the aliens were going to sound. He jokes that if he'd known that, he'd have negotiated a bigger deal. Getting all the Thermians on the same page was so important, they started having alien school for one hour a day, where the actors and any extras could learn how to speak and walk like Thermians from the Klaatu Nebula. Pariso said that the actors got into it so much, they started to add things themselves, which he was very open to. Patrick Breen, who ends up having a great death scene as Quellick, came up with the way the Thermians walked. He got the idea from Thunderbolt XL5 because the characters were marionettes. They were just having fun with it, and that energy is seen in the film. Galaxy Quest was Rain Wilson's first movie. Sir, I am Lank, Senior Requisition Officer. And the director loved him so much, he was going to give him a bigger role. But Wilson had been cast in a failed pilot for a TV series called The Expendables. Office fans say thank you. What is on your face? Is that a disguise? Missy Pyle's Thermian caught a bit of good luck when one day Spielberg was on set and thought she should have a bigger part. They realized besides Weaver, Pyle had the only other female character. This led to a relationship with Tony Shalhoub's character. And oh, by the way, the sound that Pyle made in the limousine scene was described as a baby in a bagpipe. <laughs> When the Galaxy Quest team began production in late 1998, writer Robert Gordon had no intention of keeping the name Grabthar's Hammer for the name of the item that Dr. Lazarus swears to avenge people. The name was a placeholder for something better Gordon would come up with later. It was basically the Hammer of Thor. <laughs> Just checking. And Grabthar sounded so silly, he kept meaning to change it. But around the production offices, they started to make t-shirts and the name stuck. Filming began mostly at studios in Los Angeles. DreamWorks wanted a great product, bringing in the Stan Winston studio, who was known for amazing creature visual effects from movies like The Thing, Terminator, Aliens, and Jurassic Park, among others. DreamWorks also brought in industrial light and magic to create high-quality space scenes. The people who made Galaxy Quest attributed success to the movie being allowed to become what it was going to be, to essentially grow into its own entity. Producer Mark Johnson said it's always a good thing if the studio is making another movie at the same time as yours, especially if it's very expensive, high profile, or going over budget, so all of their attention is on that movie instead of yours. Well, it just so happened that DreamWorks was also making the big budget Russell Crowe movie Gladiator at the same time. Are you not entertained? Are you not the actor Oliver Reed died during filming on that movie, so the studio had its hands full and wasn't really paying attention to Galaxy Quest. Dean Pariso jokes that there was no adult supervision, but they actually did have a fire on set. Dean wanted to shoot anamorphic, which requires a tremendous amount of lighting. Also, Steven Spielberg had suggested putting shiny mylar down on the floor to give it some life. When the crew put down the mylar and turned on the lights, everything buckled. One of the things that was important to the production is that they didn't want the sets to look cheesy. Initially, the sets were designed to look like the fake sets from 1960s Star Trek episodes, but they changed it to a more late 70s Buck Rogers style. The result is that the show both looked like a late 1970s TV show, but it also looked real. But it took more than great sets to achieve that reality. It took having a director who would direct the film as a drama and believe and love the characters so much that they are portrayed as real as possible, allowing the audience to connect to the movie in a deep way. The movie was lucky enough to have actors who really understood the fear of being typecast. As we mentioned earlier, Rickman had been trying to break out of the typical bad guy role. But it's not so much as what you choose to do as, as, as not disobeying it. And with Tim Allen coming out of a tremendous run on Home Improvement and now being in Hollywood not sure what he was going to be next, he understood the possibility of being a flash in the pan and possibly even a has-been. Allen deeply connected with this idea from the beginning and delivered it to the fans in a way that we could all see the sadness and fear of the man through his bravado. There is a scene at the beginning of the movie where Jason is in the bathroom overhearing fans talking about how pathetic he is and that his co-stars don't even like him. He actually gets oh, yeah. off on those retards thinking he's a space commander. Oh, and his friends? I know, they can't stand it. 
The scene was based on an actual experience William Shatner had in a 1986 Star Trek convention, and it's critically important to the tone of the film, because it's at this point that both the character and the audience know Jason is a character in need of redemption. Everything that happens from here on out is telling that story. And what about that heat you feel from Alexander every time he is in the same room with Jason? There was more to it than acting. At the beginning of the production, Alan and Rickman didn't get along very well. Alan embraced his lead actor status making jokes like number one had entered the room and essentially embodying the character he was playing. Rickman felt like everything was a joke with Alan and he couldn't take anything seriously. Alan said Rickman thought he was an ass right up until they started filming. And that energy off screen transfers onto the screen with every eye roll and sigh that Alexander gives Jason. So you managed to get your shirt off. And while there was the occasional tension behind scenes, in the end, Rickman did accept Alan and he respected him. A key moment of the film that was almost changed to the horror of the folks over at the Stan Winston company was that Steven Spielberg didn't like the octopus creatures. The only problem was they were already done and only three weeks from shooting. Spielberg thought the octopus were too ugly and he wanted something more like the Close Encounters aliens. Spielberg let them leave the octopus in, but they were very nearly cut from the film. One of the things that helped make Galaxy Quest a great movie was not only having an eclectic group of talented artists on the film, but also taking those artists on location outside of their daily lives and making them band together. And that's exactly what they did when the production went to Goblin Valley State Park in Utah in May of 1999. The location was perfect for the crew when they needed to go to a nearby planet to acquire a new sphere that powers the ship's reactor. Listen, we found some beryllium on a nearby planet. The park is a national monument protected by the government, and at that time, access to the park was partly by dirt road. Fees paid by the production company were used to upgrade the entire access road to asphalt, making it easier for them to get there. The place was entirely desolate. It was hot and the people were in latex suits. But while it was hard, the team also had a lot of fun out there and began bonding together. Alan, who had been working out with a trainer in preparation for his classic Kirk shirtless scene, would end up marrying his trainer and they are still married to this day. And that camaraderie would carry through the rest of the film. On June 2nd, the cast went with Sigourney Weaver to attend the 20th anniversary screening of Alien at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood. Weaver even wore her Gwen DeMarco wig. Part of it was I want to find out if blondes really do have more fun. And it's funny because if you go to that premiere's IMDb page today, you can see that the cast of Galaxy Quest is listed as participants. Then in July, Weaver surprised Daryl Mitchell on his 34th birthday with a stripper to do a quick lap dance. They put her in a uniform so they could slip her in with all the extras. But when it was time for the stripper to dance, Sigourney ran out of the room. But the hijinks didn't end there. Weaver, Mitchell, and Rockwell even created a music video on set for Weaver's agent's birthday. She met you, Sam, this is a lucky day. She can get on the phone and she can say, Wanna break bread with Durang, a film with Ang Lee, or stay at home a full-time mommy, or conversely. It became clear that the fun that took place while filming translated to fun for everyone watching the film. And while you want to have fun on a sci-fi comedy, there are moments that you also need to be serious. And this was no easy task for Alan, who wanted to make everything a joke. The one scene he absolutely couldn't make a joke was when he was forced to tell Mathazar that he wasn't really a hero and he was just an actor. Not only was the scene a critical part of the movie for Pariseau to get right, but Steven Spielberg was also on set that day. Alan nailed the scene and Spielberg was impressed, telling him so. But Alan didn't like the emotions he was feeling and went back to his trailer. Rickman commented, I think he just experienced acting. Perhaps that was just a joke for Rickman, but the truth is in that scene, not only does Tim Allen prove himself as an actor, but in that moment he also proves himself as a character. Without that moment, the movie doesn't work. There is a reason why when Gordon was writing the script, he said he found his confidence after writing that scene. Because that is the moment when the spell is broken and fans have to let go of the fantasy and embrace reality. Yes, for Thermians, it's life or death, but every Star Trek fan can understand and have empathy for that moment when Mathazar is lying on the table. That is the real moment Hart is introduced to the movie, and from this point on, the actors pretending to be heroes transform into the heroes themselves. 
Because they knew they were spoofing Star Trek in a lot of ways, there was a tremendous concern about being sued by Paramount. For example, they never used the word beam, and if you look closely, the NSEA protector's hull number is NTE-3120, and that NTE stands for Not the Enterprise. But if you're spoofing a famous TV show, there are a lot of things you can't hold back on. As opposed to shaking cameras, the crew put the stage on gimbals to actually shake the set, knocking the actors to the ground in several scenes. There's something 1960s Star Trek couldn't do. According to writer Mark Gordon, Never Give Up, Never Surrender came from Winston Churchill via a Super Tramp song because he was a huge fan of the band. And contrary to popular belief, The Rock Monster is not a reference to the cutscenes of The Rock Monsters in William Shatner's directed Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. If anything, it was more of a take on Kirk fighting the Gorn, and the little blue baby aliens are a nod to the science fiction movie Barbarella because they are cute and then mean. When Jason triggers the Omega-13, the writer had been inspired by the end of Beneath the Planet of the Apes. The scene where Tommy takes the protector out of space dock and scratches the hull against the side is a nod to Star Trek The Motion Picture and that big special effect of taking the Enterprise out into space. Also, there is a very special technical aspect to this movie that not only some fans miss, but movie theaters missed as well. The movie starts out in a classic letterbox while showing scenes from the original Galaxy Quest series, then it changes to a standard 185 aspect ratio. Then, when the hangar opens and Jason sees space for the first time, the camera goes into 235 widescreen cinemascope. It's very subtle. In fact, so subtle, some theaters didn't realize and ended up displaying part of the movie off into the curtains. The studio had to start sending instructions to the theaters on when to adjust to get the full movie onto the screen. David Newman created the score for Galaxy Quest. He was a huge Star Trek fan, and once he saw the movie, it really motivated him to give it a great sound. He used Nicholas Meyer's Star Trek and John Williams' original Lost in Space to come up with a sweeping theme song with otherworldly tones for Galaxy Quest. A lot of people think the inspiration for the Chompers at the end of the movie was inspired by classic Star Trek, but it wasn't. Gordon got the idea after seeing the corridor lined with rotating blades in the 1997 movie Event Horizon. Galaxy Quest became so popular with Star Trek fans that at the 2013 convention in Las Vegas, a poll was taken and ranked Galaxy Quest the seventh best Star Trek film of the 12 that had been created up until then. The evil reptilian warlord Ceres was named for the film critic Andrew Ceres, who once trashed producer Mark Johnson's 1984 film The Natural. Also, Ceres' eye patch mimics the one worn by General Chang, played by Christopher Plummer in Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. Also, if you look closely, you can see that the design of the NSEA protector is based on a Star Trek comm badge. Also, George Takai, who played Sulu on Star Trek The Original Series, said Galaxy Quest is a chillingly realistic documentary, which really doesn't come as a surprise considering his very public feud with William Shatner. In 2006, Paramount Pictures acquired DreamWorks, who made this film. When Paramount was folded back into CBS in 2019, it brought the Star Trek films and TV series all under the same roof with Galaxy Quest. The character Guy Fliegman was an intentional homage to Star Trek The Next Generation's actor Guy Vardaman, who not only played several no-name extras in the series, but also served as a stunt stand-in double for Brent Spiner, who played Commander Data, and Will Wheaton, who played Wesley Crusher. Ironically, crewman number six, Guy Fliegman's character in the original Galaxy Quest show, asked to tag along in the movie with the five members of the NSEA Protector, literally making him the sixth crew member. Gwen DeMarco has a scene where she laments about her TV Guide interview that was six paragraphs of my boobs and how they fit in my suit, which is exactly what happened to Jerry Ryan, who played Seven of Nine on Star Trek Voyager. According to the film, Sam Rockwell's character played an adult in the original series, but Daryl Mitchell's character played a child. What's interesting is Mitchell is actually three years older than Rockwell. The promotional campaign for the movie included a mockumentary for the E-Cable channel about the fictitious Galaxy Quest television series titled Galaxy Quest 20th Anniversary, The Journey Continues. Most of the cast members appeared as their actor characters from the film. Extras from the film's convention scenes also appear as fans giving candid interviews. Outtakes and behind-the-scenes footage from the film were used as clips from the television series. 
The humor went so far as Gwen DeMarco claiming she had turned down a small part in a Woody Allen movie to do the Galaxy Quest series, which is a nod to Sigourney Weaver's early gig as an extra in Annie Hall. And with the internet still in its infant stages back in 1999, Galaxy Quest was one of the earliest movies to have its own domain name and website. GalaxyQuest.com, which can be seen on the Wayback Archive, chose to be designed more like a fan page of the time, complete with screen captures and poor HTML coding, as opposed to being a polished part of the film's marketing campaign. Perhaps the marketing is something they should have reconsidered for this movie, as we'll see in just a moment. When Galaxy Quest went into post-production, there was a feeling among the cast and production crew that the studio didn't really understand or care about the film. In fact, after screeners, DreamWorks didn't think the movie was very good. That combined with an event that adults in their 30s today will be very familiar with greatly impacted the final version of Galaxy Quest. What was this juggernaut of an event? The movie Rugrats came out. The popular Nickelodeon animated television series hit theaters just in time for Thanksgiving 1998. And not only did it open number one, but it became the first non-Disney animated film to gross over $100 million in the United States. This is what DreamWorks was looking for, a family comedy that could pull the Rugrats audience. The problem was, Galaxy Quest wasn't shot that way. Gordon would later say that when he originally wrote the script, he wasn't thinking about a family film. He just wrote what he wanted to see. So at the end of the movie, when the ship lands in the convention hall, in the original draft, it decapitates a bunch of people. There were also scenes that they shot where Gwen tries to seduce some of the aliens, and that's why her shirt is ripped at the end. The way the film had been shot, the movie would be PG-13 at best, and in the minds of DreamWorks, that wasn't going to compete with Stuart Little. So Don Zimmerman, a 30-year veteran in the editing business, got to work. Everything that took the movie out of a PG category ended up on the cutting room floor, including a hilarious F-bomb from Weaver just before she and Alan are supposed to enter the chompers. If you look at her mouth, you can see she is clearly saying the F-word. Daryl Mitchell had to admit that when they cut all the profanity out of the movie, it worked. And most fans would agree that being able to watch the movie with their kids and sharing it with them makes it worth the PG rating. The marketing, on the other hand, it has some explaining to do. According to Pariseau, the movie was marketed as a Christmas movie to 8 to 12 year olds. And yes, the movie was great for kids, but it wasn't made for them. From the moment the movie premiered at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, everyone thought it was going to be a huge hit. The movie was fantastic. The only problem was, no one was going to see it. Kids were going to see the Mouse movie, not the Tim Allen in Space movie. The studio had made a huge mistake. Rickman knew something was wrong when the logo didn't change from the call sheet to the poster. According to Johnson, Terry Press, who is now the president of CBS Films, was the head of marketing at DreamWorks at the time and didn't believe in the movie. Johnson explained there was a critical screening in the Valley and Terry was pregnant with twins and couldn't go. Had she been there, she would have realized this was an audience movie. Johnson said they never got one sheet poster right for the movie. He was approached by industry insiders who told him who would have guessed this movie was going to be so good. Definitely not a good sign. Pariseau would later say that Jeffrey Katzenberg called him during the second week and apologized for blowing it. The production team had been telling DreamWorks there was a much larger audience, but they just didn't believe it. When adults started showing up after the second week, it sustained the film, earning them the same amount of money for four weeks in a row, which would keep Galaxy Quest from being a bomb. But it's what happened after the movies left theaters that is the real story of Galaxy Quest. After Harold Ramis saw the film, he said he had never been more wrong in his life. The cult following began in earnest when DreamWorks released the VHS and DVD on May 2, 2000. The DVD included a 10-minute behind-the-scenes feature, cast and crew biographies, and deleted scenes. It was a must-own for any Star Trek fan's library. The film won the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation, the Nebula Award for Best Script, and it was nominated for 10 Saturn Awards, including Best Science Fiction Film, Best Director, Best Actress for Weaver, Best Supporting Actor for Rickman, and Allen winning Best Actor. In November 1999, Galaxy Quest was novelized by science fiction writer Terry Bassone who stayed very close to the plot of the film. In 2008, a comic book sequel to the movie was released by IDW Publishing, entitled Galaxy Quest Global Warning. In 2015, IDW launched an ongoing series set several years after the events of the film. Ironically, Galaxy Quest, which was inspired by Star Trek, did some inspiring of its own. 
The movie would go on to influence the Star Trek 2009 movie. J.J. Abrams, a huge fan of Galaxy Quest, had the green lighting of Ceres' ship repeated in Nero's ship, the Narada. He also borrowed the idea of how Ceres' ship was destroyed headlong for Nero's ship. And when Eric Bana was struggling for ideas on how to play Nero, Abrams showed him a copy of Galaxy Quest and told him to portray him in a similar way to how Robin Sachs played Ceres. And it didn't take long after Galaxy Quest that fans were asking for a sequel. According to Perso, DreamWorks was initially interested in making a television television show about Thermians. It had to do with a younger bunch of actors who were now on the show, so it would have been old crew versus new crew. Pariseau credited DreamWorks for this because the movie had not been a financial success. True talk of a sequel didn't begin until 2014 when Tim Allen mentioned there was a script for a second movie. Sigourney Weaver and Sam Rockwell wanted to come back for the sequel, but Enrico Colantoni came out against it, saying a sequel might tarnish the characters from the first film. In April 2015, Paramount Television, along with Galaxy Quest's writer and director and executive producers, announced they were looking to develop a television series based on Galaxy Quest. And in August of that year, it was announced that Amazon Studios would be developing it. But then, in January 2016, the unthinkable happened. Alan Rickman passed away unexpectedly from pancreatic cancer. Following that, Tim Allen had the following to say about the sequel. I'm not supposed to say anything. I'm speaking out of turn here, but Galaxy Quest is really close to being resurrected in a very creative way. It's closer than I can tell you, but I can't say more than that. The real kicker is that Alan Rickman now has to be left out. It's been a shock on many levels. Then in April 2016, Rockwell revealed that the cast had been about to sign on for a follow-up with Amazon, but Rickman's death along with Alan's television schedule had proved to be obstacles. He also said he believed Rickman's death meant the project would never happen. However, the plans were revived in August 2017 with the announcement that Paul Scheer would be writing the series. Scheer said that in his first draft submitted to Amazon, he wanted to create a serialized adventure that starts where the film ends, but leads into the cultural shift in Star Trek that has occurred since 1999. He said he wanted to capture the difference between the original cast of Star Trek and J.J. Abrams' cast of Star Trek. To that end, Shear's initial scripts called for two separate cast sets that would come together by the end of the first season of the show, though he didn't confirm any of this included the original film's cast. Then, in January 2021, Tim Allen stated that a film sequel script was nearly ready to go. The script had been near completion by 2016, but with Rickman's death, it would have to undergo major rewrites as the core story focused on the relationship between Nesmith and Dane. A central plot point of the film was to have the Protector and its crew affected by a time dilation during spaceflight. This would allow for older age characters to come back right after the events of the film. Then, in June 2021, Georgia Pritchett said in an interview that she and Simon Pegg were working on developing a Galaxy Quest series. But in the year and a half following that announcement, there has been no further word. Regardless of what happens to Galaxy Quest in the future, its place in history and its legacy celebrating Star Trek fans will stand the test of time. It didn't make fun of the fans. It celebrated them. Galaxy Quest is about what makes Star Trek special. The fans. By Grabthar's hammer, by the sons of Warvan, I shall avenge you. What are your thoughts on Galaxy Quest? Did you see it in the theater, or did you find it later as it grew in popularity? After 24 years, do you still want a sequel to the movie or perhaps a streaming series? Let's talk about it in the comments below. Also, if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, please do so now. And give us a thumbs up if you want more definitive histories like this. Don't forget to buy a Galaxy Quest t-shirt on your way out. Thank you. Woo!